high honor for me to introduce uh, our next guest, who has traveled, I believe, the furthest uh, out of everyone for this conference to be here. Uh, and we really appreciate the effort that you made uh, in journeying to Berlin on the occasion of the Berlin International Economics Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, Hans B. Sikat is president and CEO of the Philippine Stock Exchange. Sikat earned his bachelor's degree in mathematics and master of arts in economics in the University of the Philippines. He started his career in the financial markets in 1985 as an analyst and staff member of Asset Products Department of Citibank, New York, becoming the Vice President and Capital Markets Asia Head in November 1992. He became Managing Director for Asian Fixed Income for Citibank International Limited, Hong Kong, where he served from 1993 until 1996. From 2000 until 2008, he was the Chief Representative for Global Markets Asia Pacific LTD, Philippine Representative Office, and a member of the Country Coordinating Committee of Citibank, uh, Citigroup Philippines. In all, Mr. Sikat has spent two decades as an international investment banker for various uh, predecessor firms for the Citigroup. In 2008, he co-founded the Knowledge Processing Outsourcing KPO firm, Ligus Pro Corporation, and is currently serving as President and CEO. He joined the PSE, the Philippine Stock Exchange, in 2009 as the director and was the former chairman of the board of directors. He has also been appointed chair of the Philippine Stock Exchange Corporate Governance Committee. In December 2010, he was appointed president and CEO of the Philippine Stock Exchange. The lecture topic that he has chosen for today is Capital Market in the Philippines, Sustaining Growth and Creating Opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Mr. Hans B. Sikat. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great to be here in Berlin. And uh, it's okay. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to thank uh, the ICD and uh, Mr. Mark Donfried for uh, inviting me. It's certainly a different uh, audience. Uh, and uh, I'm also, though, very delighted to be, I guess, the second Asian speaker following Dr. Supachai yesterday uh, to actually talk uh, today. I was also very delighted, uh, uh, having come here yesterday, to meet uh, essentially a family friend, almost a relative, really, uh, in uh, Anna Burkhalter. I had actually met her parents uh, when we were all studying in, uh, in Philadelphia, I guess, many, many years ago. So the ICD, uh, hopefully, uh, is a good friend or will be a good friend uh, for many years to come in, in, on many levels. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a few things, uh, maybe give you some background about uh, the Philippines and the re relations uh, with Germany, and really talk about uh, the, what's happening in the Philippines today. It's actually boom times uh, right now. Talk about the capital market in particular and uh, what we're doing to sustain uh, that growth. And hopefully uh, I can address uh, some questions uh, later on if you find the topic, uh, I guess, uh, quite interesting. So uh, one of the interesting things which I found out researching uh, for this uh, uh, talk is that uh, Hamburg actually uh, established the relations with the Philippines way back in 1849. That I did not know until about a few days ago. And I think uh, a few things here, our national hero, Jose Rizal, Dr. Jose Rizal, actually spent some time uh, in this country as he was uh, learning about uh, uh, the ways of uh, the West, so to speak. And actually, his uh, time in, uh, in Germany was very important in terms of his, uh, developing his own thought process, which contributed to the uh, uh, in uh, independent, uh, independence movement in the Philippines. Of course, we all know Oktoberfest, which we celebrate in the Philippines with Gusto. One of the largest companies is a beer company called San Miguel Corporation. Uh, and, uh, Clearly, that's one of the uh, reasons why uh, it's a, uh, how would I call it, a very popular uh, festival, uh, I guess, end of September, beginning of October. Now, in terms of the actual trade relations, uh, what's interesting is that uh, there's been uh, quite a bit of uh, exports to Germany, although uh, it's not the top trading partner of the Philippines. And I would say that uh, a lot of cultural exchanges uh, where we have the uh, German club, as well as other organizations in Manila uh, sponsoring uh, such uh, cultural uh, exchanges. Philippine presence in Germany, there are actually a few Filipinos uh, living here, uh, as well as uh, 
a huge part of the economy is driven by what we call overseas foreign remittances from those uh, Filipino citizens. And I think what we can track is uh, somewhere to the region of about 400 million US dollars comes from Germany straight back uh, into the country every year. And uh, a number of uh, companies, Bank Banco de Oro BDO, ABS-CBN, for example, are very large uh, or has some presence uh, here uh, in Germany. ABS-CBN is a media company. In the Philippines, uh, of course, Lufthansa and Lufthansa's uh, uh, technical uh, partner, they, they actually maintain airplanes in the Philippines. Uh, Deutsche Bank is a, a favorite, and which I have also found out quite recently, one of the most prominent families in the Philippines, the Zobels, uh, actually a Spanish family, descended apparently from uh, Germanic origins. And they have a 200-year-old uh, group of companies, which is very, very prominent in the Philippines, uh, headed by the Ayala Corporation and the Bank, Bank of the Philippine Islands. Now, what's happening in the Philippines? I mentioned earlier, it's quite different from the perhaps the crisis, the Eurozone crisis, as well as the issues that, that are faced in uh, America. And in fact, uh, it's been a boom, uh, a series of boom years. Uh, and if you take a look at it, uh, growth is roughly in the mid to high 6% range uh, per year and uh, continuing to increase inflation at very low levels, as well as a competitive ranking, uh, which is improving relative to the rest of the world. Uh, one of the things that we watch quite a bit is uh, what we call credit upgrades. And for those of you uh, who've uh, uh, taken a look at it. In the financial space, credit uh, grades uh, are, uh, are very important because it tends to dictate where you are in the, in the relative space of uh, uh, confidence as well as where you are in the credit uh, arena. And uh, the Philippines is maybe half a step away from what's being called investment grade according to the three rating agencies. And that's being watched very closely because the betting is that perhaps in the next six to 12 months, the country will indeed be upgraded to um, investment grade, thereby also increasing business confidence and continuing the sustained economic growth. Now, the Philippine economy is uh, actually driven by two large sectors. I mentioned the uh, overseas foreign uh, worker remittances of about $20 billion uh, per year. And what we call the BPO sector, that stands for the business process outsourcing sector. These are the businesses like call centers, administrative offices, uh, essentially virtual secretaries, if you will, uh, as well as accounting, uh, engineering uh, type work. Uh, it's a sunrise industry in the Philippines. And in fact, uh, it's probably set to overtake the level of overseas remittances that we get uh, in the next two to three years. Um, what it does, though, is that it's created a, a good uh, uh, virtual cycle. And the GDP is actually driven primarily by what we call household consumption. There's a lot of real estate buying right now, buyers of first homes, buyers of uh, you know, uh, what, might call, what used to be called electronics and the white goods for the home. Now, I think the Philippines is enjoying a huge and improved investment climate, uh, particularly due to the improved governance, not just on the political scale and the national scale, but also in terms of the uh, corporate governance on uh, individual uh, companies. And it reflects in this uh, business confident, confidence index uh, over the last uh, three years, which continues to actually grow. And this is actually uh, something that's taken by the, uh, a survey taken by the central bank, what you see in the right-hand side. What's also changed is really when you take a look at the viewpoint from external sources. And I, and I think whether it's the IMF, the World Bank, uh, financial institutions, and other players in the financial marketplace, generally the description of the Philippines over the last two years is positive and basically talks about why the Philippines will continue to be a good investment destination, primarily because it's outpacing the, uh, a lot of countries in the world a lot of our own Southeast Asian neighbors, even though uh, we used to be called, uh, I guess, uh, just as recently as a decade ago, uh, this, or a decade and a half ago, as the sick man of Asia, which is no longer. Where to invest? There's a little bit of, uh, I guess, advertising now on my part. So we talk about the sound macroeconomic uh, environment. 
uh, resilient stock market indicators and a lot of growth drivers in the economy. Uh, interestingly enough, and maybe I'll go to the next slide, uh, the stock exchanges for background is actually one of the oldest in Southeast Asia. Our predecessor firm was founded, the Manila Stock Exchange was founded over, uh, I guess, 80 years ago. Uh, we, we were merged just about 20 years ago into the Philippine Stock Exchange. And uh, we have about 250 odd uh, companies listed on our exchange. Now, I was talking about stock market highlights. What's interesting, if you take a look at the last three years, it's really been an incredible boom. And even today, 2013, uh, just the other day on Wednesday, the market uh, posted another high, uh, another record, uh, an index level, uh, which we call the PSEI for the Philippine Stock Exchange Index, representing the top 30 names in the country. Uh, and that index itself has grown, uh, I guess, close to 18% already, and it's only March. Uh, during the year, uh, yeah, the first uh, third of the year. Again, looking over the last uh, three years uh, and comparing ourselves even year to date, what's quite interesting is that the Philippines, uh, if you measure the performance against other uh, Asian indices, is the, uh, I guess, the top performing index uh, over the last few years as well as uh, this year alone. Uh, interestingly enough, the World Federation of Exchanges which is the grouping of all stock exchanges in the world, uh, came out with an analysis uh, about uh, two months ago saying that the Philippines on many levels is either the best performing or the fastest growing exchange and economy uh, in the world, not just in, uh, in Asia. So that was, I guess, a pleasant surprise. And I guess a bit of good news for uh, the country, for a country like the Philippines, which for many years had been uh, under the, or uh, under the uh, a different uh, label. Some stock market highlights, it's all growth. Uh, maybe I'll just mention a few things. Uh, one of the most interesting things is that our average daily trading volumes today, which is that uh, upper right-hand chart, uh, is today roughly around 230 million US dollars equivalent. That's already uh, twice of what it was just about 18 months ago, uh, somewhere in, in 2011. So that's an incredible growth rate, but perhaps more interestingly enough, and talking about uh, the stock market as a source for raising funds uh, in the country, is that last year, 2012, was a record year wherein about five billion US dollars was raised through the exchange for all types of products. Again, a record number, considering that 2011 was in itself, perhaps uh, prior to that, the highest amount uh, ever raised in, uh, through the stock exchange. Uh, some people ask me what's driving all of this interest, and uh, a lot of people say it's because of the interest of foreign money coming into the Philippines. That's actually true, uh, and true to one extent. Uh, we're in uh, net foreign uh, transactions, which you see in the top bar chart, uh, is about uh, three times what it was uh, just a year previously. But what's interesting is that uh, when you take a look at the breakdown, who is actually bringing in more money? Filipinos or foreigners into the economy. And I think that over the last uh, three years, it still has been actually Philippine money coming back into the system, which is a great vote of confidence, which is driving the economy. It is a reversal from what we saw uh, as recently as 2006, where in the foreign uh, investors were actually the bigger driver of the economy. Uh, as of, uh, for example, 2010, that uh, number actually reversed. We're in uh, that pie chart uh, on the lower left-hand side. It was actually domestic money, uh, which was at 60% coming into the stock market, and it was uh, foreigners at 40%. That was in about that was in 2010, and last year, 2012, uh, foreign money had uh, grown to something about 50, uh, five, uh, sorry, 45%, and 55% for domestic funds. So I guess the news here is that. Uh, whether in the Philippines or uh, overseas Filipinos bringing money back into the country, there's a strong vote of confidence in the economy, what's happening, and therefore a huge reinvestment rate um, that is actually driving, let's say, the foreign uh, investors to actually come and hopefully catch the up, uh, uptick wave. What's our economic outlook for this year? We do think that uh, 
the uh, economy will perform quite well with a growth rate uh, actually in the mid uh, 6% range and relatively low inflation. And I think the interest rate environment will continue to be quite low, which will drive a lot of activity and, or continued activity into the uh, uh, economy. And uh, finally, there will continue to be strong domestic consumption, which will pump prime uh, demands for, uh, for goods and therefore continuous uh, uh, economic uh, growth. In terms of sectors, uh, we think that uh, a number of sectors will do well this year. The financial institutions, which are the banks, as well as some of the other uh, insurance companies, will continue to do well, mainly because they're very well capitalized and clearly they benefit from being part of the uh, whole economy. The property sector, there's huge demand for uh, first-time residential homes, a lot of demand for business units uh, today, and that will continue to grow uh, for the next few years. Uh, the industrial sector, there's a lot of investment in infrastructure going on, and it is actually quite important because infrastructure, as you know, is the multiplier effect for continuous development in any economy, and we think will be a very strong driver. And uh, today what's happening in the Philippines, there's a very strong public-private partnership that's going on. And uh, with demand and the, with the economy growing, by the way, one of the uh, subsectors that should benefit well are, or is the uh, power generation uh, companies. Finally, services, uh, we talk about tourist arrivals uh, increasing. We continue, we continue to see that they're growing. And uh, perhaps uh, one of the, uh, I guess, somewhat uh, uh, positive, but also a, a big topic uh, in the Philippines are the development of the gaming and entertainment hub. So it's going to be quite similar to what you've seen in Macau uh, and maybe even southern China. And a number of huge casino complexes are going up uh, uh, in uh, Metro Manila uh, right now. Milestones, I'll talk about uh, what's happening in the exchange uh, itself, uh, and I'll uh, limit my comments here. But I think the most important thing uh, outside of uh, uh, extending, uh, let's call it trading hours, is that uh, we are uh, in a uh, series of changes that we've implemented, uh, focusing a lot on corporate governance. Corporate governance within the exchange, corporate governance within publicly listed companies who are listed on the exchange. And we've done that through a number of ways. We've actually segregated the, uh, let's call it the policing function uh, of the exchange now to uh, an independent company, which we fund but actually reports directly up to the Securities and Exchange Commission. We have launched our own Good Governance Awards, which I talked about earlier this morning. And uh, we also talk about uh, total market surveillance uh, system, uh, where we actually bought uh, a pretty sophisticated system from the Korea Stock Exchange to actually monitor, uh, hopefully, uh, the behavior of uh, various broker dealers, such that if they're trying to uh, be bad guys, front run, insider trading, that type of thing, uh, we will catch them. Uh, I'm pleased to note that for the first time also, uh, when I came in as CEO, uh, one of the things that I acted on was actually to delist five companies that were continuously uh, in violation of uh, many, uh, let's call it, exchange regulations. And uh, they were able to maintain their listing because of uh, perhaps uh, expensive lawyers that they were using to, uh, uh, to stop it. Uh, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a businessman. So I, I said, you know, sue me, uh, you're out of here. And I think the market uh, actually congratulated us with the exception of five law firms who called me the next morning who were very upset. Uh, so that's one. I should also say that for the first time in the Philippines uh, that uh, uh, we caught one broker dealer who was actually uh, in the midst of uh, fraudulent activity, defrauding his own clients. The trial is now ongoing and I'm very pleased to say it's the first example of uh, jail time for white collar crime that's uh, been uh, demonstrated in the Philippines. So uh, corporate governance is one of the pillars of our own uh, uh, effort to increase activity in the country, uh, uh, in, the, in the financial sector. And, and I think that uh, that coupled with uh, being quite firm on a number of fronts is quite important in terms of delivering not just a message, but also making sure that the investment climate in the Philippines remains to be one uh, where everybody believes that there is going to be an even playing field, as well as perhaps a very just and uh, fair 
uh, playing field. Oh, I should say that uh, we do a lot of market education uh, and uh, a lot of our data, if you, we have our website, please uh, check that through. We also are on Twitter, so the Philippine Stock Exchange has a Twitter handle, and I actually also have a Twitter handle, which I haven't accessed in the last two days, but I probably should say something about the ICD speech uh, today. So follow us on, on Twitter. It's a good way to actually get an insight as to what's happening in the Philippines. We have a, a Facebook page as well, and uh, we're, so we're trying to use uh, a lot of social media to interact with uh, the younger people as well as uh, anyone who's curious. And throughout uh, the country, we have now started up with regional resource centers to actually spread the word. Finally, and we, uh, you'll probably hear about this in the next uh, 10 days, we are making an announcement. We're calling it the Online Service Bureau. What that is really is we're trying to bring down the cost of uh, providing an online platform for broker dealers such that they will, for their own clients, uh, actually allow uh, uh, trading for retail investors like you and me through the computer, through your laptop, iPad, and through your phone. So in about 10 days, uh, you will hear a big announcement. And uh, we, we believe that this is going to contribute very highly to bringing in a wider number of uh, retail investors into the market. There are actually three players right now, and amongst them, obviously, with even with low uh, numbers, the penetration rates are growing very fast to the tune of about 30% uh, per year on a compound annual uh, growth rate. So that's an amazing number. And we, we think that we can actually reach about uh, 5 million Filipinos, uh, hopefully in the next few years, just by uh, launching this thing. Finally, I should talk about uh, a couple of uh, uh, products that we are uh, launching on the exchange. Basically, all of these uh, products will increase, hopefully, uh, participation in the capital market, make us competitive, and obviously attract more investors and issuers onto the market. I should also say, and it's not here in this slide, that there's a huge cooperation uh, that's uh, going on uh, between the Philippines and all the ASEAN countries, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation countries. And that's because uh, our ministers uh, last year signed a, uh, uh, an agreement saying that by 2015, ASEAN will have a, uh, a stronger economic cooperation model. Now, what's happened is that tariffs around ASEAN are now coming lower. And in the service sector, the financial sector, we're, which we're uh, representing, uh, I think you will find that by 2015, uh, the, at least the basic uh, five uh, or six uh, ASEAN countries, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, and Vietnam, will be interconnected uh, directly uh, or have their, the computers in, uh, interconnected such that if I, for example, as an investor in the Philippines want to buy a stock in Singapore, I can do that very quickly. Clearly, there are many challenges to doing that uh, regulatory financial, as well as basic techno technological issues. But uh, that project has started. And uh, I think you will find that uh, it's an exciting project and hopefully will be part of a larger and more competitive ASEAN as we uh, uh, brand ourselves uh, as uh, ASEAN Inc., if you will, uh, moving forward, uh, basically to gain size and obviously to have a larger market, both for issuers and for investors. And I guess finally, uh, I'm going to end by uh, saying that uh, I do welcome you to the Philippines for those of you who have not been there. Uh, it's a very interesting country. Uh, our colleagues are uh, there, the ITB across town, uh, trying to promote the tourism angle. I actually stole their video or one of their videos uh, from them. So I'll see whether it plays and uh, uh, give you maybe 30 seconds or 60 seconds of uh, an invitation to the Philippines. fun in the Philippines. It's quite interesting because uh, over the last uh, two years, with the uh, uh, growth in the, let's call it the exchange and the index, uh, in fact, uh, it's now become a staple of our own president, president's, uh, let's, let's call it uh, 
uh, pitching uh, to the rest of the world. And uh, you know, last year the uh, the Philippines hit uh, or the index hit a record of uh, 38, uh, a record high 38 times or something like that. And, and uh, a, a number of uh, let's call it uh, manufacturing firms. Uh, uh, Japan Inc. is actually coming in back into the Philippines in a big way with manufacturing uh, facilities. Uh, that's actually quite huge uh, from a, a, a foreign direct investment uh, point of view. And so I think that uh, the exchange performance as well as perhaps the Im improvement of governance in the Philippines overall is a huge driver to this effort. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll try to answer the, uh, 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 the questions. Uh, uh, so I think the uh, the first uh, question was on uh, um, uh, who, who are the consumers, for example, of the real estate sector. Uh, actually, it's being driven by the uh, commercial sector. Uh, so it's uh, primarily uh, buildings for business uh, on one end. Uh, so that's uh, primarily local companies. There are a few multinational companies who are moving back in, providing demand. but. Uh, uh, in terms of the commercial sector, the largest uh, user is actually the business process outsourcing industry. So that itself is a local sector, even though it, it does support uh, primarily global companies. And, and of course, maybe the bias is the BPO industry supports uh, the U US uh, based companies, in, if you take a look at the distribution. But having said that, on the residential side, again, the drivers are uh, on the individual side continue to be local uh, investors. Mainly, there's a lot of buyers from the, let's call it uh, starter units. So, so these are essentially employees, young employees of these companies, you know, and they're in their 20s buying their starter studio or, or one bedroom uh, condominium. Uh, there are a few uh, uh, numbers which suggest that about 20 to 25% of the buyers uh, are funded by the overseas foreign workers. But that's a, uh, essentially a local phenomenon because what that means is that simply that uh, from the transfers of the families from overseas, they usually give uh, their families uh, some money. What they're spending it on is, is not essentially consumption, but buying uh, you know, their starter unit. So uh, that's probably a relatively safe uh, situation from, uh, from a real estate uh, point of view. I think the second question has to do with the uh, influence of China, Japan uh, as trading partners. Uh, I should say that uh, the U.S. still remains as the primary trading partner of the Philippines, but China and Japan, I believe, are actually second and third in terms of volume and uh, value both ways. Uh, clearly, they're very important, uh, and uh, if you take a look at the fact that uh, the Philippine economy has also a bias towards uh, a lot of Filipino-Chinese entrepreneurs. So the China connection is quite uh, strong. What's dangerous, though, is that uh, in the last, uh, uh, I, I guess, the last uh, nine months or so, there have been some disputes, uh, territorial disputes, which I think Dr. Superchai mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, between China, Japan, China, uh, Philippines, China, Vietnam. Uh, we think they're irritants as opposed to major uh, issues, and I think diplomacy will prevail, uh, despite the fact that uh, in some cases there have been some shooting between, uh, I guess, fishing boats of both nations, or supposedly fishing boats of uh, Philippines and, and China. Um, I guess the final question was the view on uh, uh, how one uh, uh, w w would view, say, child labor, cheap labor. Uh, in, in the Philippines? Well, well, first of all, I think that uh, the country subscribes to the fact that uh, while labor is still relatively cheap, by, by the way, it, it is not the cheapest in uh, Asia or, or even Southeast Asia. I think, in fact, uh, one of the problems of the Philippines today is that a, a lot of the uh, traditional goods and services that you, could, that you used to be able to do in the Philippines have now migrated outside the Philippines. And uh, it's actually some of the uh, uh, countries like uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, Laos, uh, and even Burma now taking over some of the low cost uh, issues. So uh, from the Philippine perspective, uh, there will continue to be, of course, some operations which, uh, which are in the uh, 
lower cost end of things and most basic things. And uh, there are quite strict labor laws. I, and, and I think that uh, there is a very strong uh, effort uh, by the authorities such that uh, you, you do not get into situations wherein child labor is exploited in a, uh, I guess, in, in the old normal ways where it used to be that uh, authorities would turn uh, a blind eye to the practice. Uh, uh, so that's, uh, I guess, less of a problem these days, but uh, clearly an issue in some of the uh, uh, provincial uh, areas. Uh, the main language is, uh, is English, actually American English, so that might disappoint a few of you. <laughs> the legal system in English. Legal system in Eng uh, no, the legal system is actually American, not, not English. So uh, that's a probably resonating from the fact that uh, the Philippines was a, a colony of, uh, of the US, or the only colony of the US uh, in 1898. So, so we inherited that. Uh, there are probably also too many lawyers in, in the Philippines right now as a result. It's a joke. <laughs> Tax. Uh, tax system is, uh, uh, we have a basic income tax, uh, a progressive taxation system, uh, actually relatively high compared to our uh, East Asian neighbors. Uh, for example, uh, corporate uh, income taxes uh, and actually personal income taxes run at about 32%, uh, whereas uh, in Hong Kong, it's about the 17%, uh, and Singapore is, uh, is quite low as well. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's one of these issues that uh, uh, from a business perspective, we're trying to lower because we believe that lower taxation actually promotes more growth. At this uh, point in time, uh, well, first of all, uh, inflation is quite low. And in, in fact, some sectors are probably, in fact, are, are definitely under, uh, still underperforming uh, relative to the rest. We don't see the risk of uh, any demand pull inflation in the short run. Uh, I think the central bank has done a wonderful job in terms of uh, uh, targeting uh, inflation rates. Uh, that's been a job that they've been doing very well over the last 10 years. And by, by the way, I would argue that it's perhaps the one single foundation of uh, why you have an economic boom in the Philippines today, that the central bank has done it, had done its job uh, very consistently over the last uh, decade. Uh, it's a common topic now, and in fact, uh, uh, I spoke earlier about the issue of uh, mining or responsible mining in, in the Philippines. So mining is a huge industry, has always been, uh, at least for the last uh, maybe 60 years, um, where you have uh, not just local companies, but uh, global multinational uh, mining firms uh, in the country. There's a very heightened uh, uh, level of information and debate being demanded uh, by uh, not just uh, the government, but also by civil society on this one. Uh, the answer is uh, firms do care. And, and I think that they're paying uh, a lot of attention, uh, uh, at least those firms who are, uh, whom I call uh, responsible miners. The problem actually in this particular sector lies not with the mining companies, but usually with the what we call the illegal uh, independent miners who, are, who don't register with the SEC, who kind of just go ahead with a small operation and actually uh, you know, have their leaching pond or dynamite things uh, uh, without uh, regard uh, for the environment. Now, the other thing, uh, talk about uh, tourism, and as well as uh, some of the uh, efforts that uh, the country has had uh, with fishing. You know, the old days, uh, there would be some areas where dynamite fishing was actually the norm. Uh, that's actually stopped now. Uh, one of the biggest uh, attractions in the Philippines uh, these days uh, is actually swimming with a whale shark. So you can have an experience by uh, going off and, uh, and, and basically uh, swimming with a whale shark. And these fishing communities have been transformed to effectively ecotourism partners by the government. So it's a wonderful experience. If you, you get a chance, uh, do come swim with the whale sharks. They're absolutely phenomenal. And uh, you're going to hear stories from the fishermen who used to actually uh, spear these, uh, these uh, whales, actually, and, uh, and now are actually their partners. So it's a huge environmental movement going on. That's actually a tough question, but I'll, I'll try to answer it. I think the, the answer is that uh, the Philippines has always been, a, from an economic policy standpoint, quite a middle of the road and, 
and basically a uh, free trade type uh, focus, uh, had a free trade type focus, which is very much the same as all the ASEAN tigers, if you will, and uh, perhaps the same philosoph philosophy as the BRIC economies, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The, the differentiating factor over the last few years, and, and the Philippines is on its way, uh, let me see, I guess in the uh, mid-90s, uh, where when the leadership uh, had passed on uh, after the revolution that, that took out uh, President Marcos, uh, uh, there was a president after uh, Ms. Aquino and, and her, her successor, uh, Fidel Ramos, uh, and they were viewed as uh, leaders who were uh, not only uh, uh, very strong in their belief of uh, economic growth, but also had personal, very high personal integrity, and also focused on corporate governance uh, as a way. Now, uh, we come to Aquino uh, the second, the son of uh, President Aquino. It's been his drive to wipe out uh, corruption. In fact, he, he ran on an anti-corruption platform saying that uh, if corruption were not there or minimized, then you would not have the poverty uh, uh, or the situation of poverty that you see in some places in the Philippines. So uh, this is the, uh, he's done a very good job in terms of taking out some very high profile uh, names. Uh, in fact, no president has ever done that successfully before. And perhaps the largest example was him taking out the chief justice who was actually accused of, uh, well, of uh, let's call it uh, activities that a chief justice of the Supreme Court should not be doing. And that has resonated so much across the nation in, in terms of demonstrating that uh, the country is quite serious in terms of maintaining uh, you know, rule of law, that there's actually a level playing field, that things are transparent. So a lot of the things that we're doing in the economic sphere, the, the financial sphere, are beginning to in fact hold uh, uh, or, or get, a, get stronger traction, it's probably the correct way to put it. And because of that, uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, we've had, by the way, very bright and brilliant economic ministers, finance ministers uh, over the last few years. But really, the differentiating factor in the Philippine case has been the view that the political leadership was actually sincere as well as practicing, let's call it, uh, good corporate governance themselves. And I think it's only from the uh, period of, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Aquino, uh, the previous president, up to now. And, and now we're, we're actually seeing the benefits of... Uh, of such, uh, I guess, behavior. Answer it. We have one more question. Salam al Zahra from Lebanon. Uh, I wanted to ask what the legis legislator uh, done to fight the child labor in the Philippines. Actually, there are uh, a few uh, labor laws that, uh, uh, number one, define uh, uh, minimum ages as well as uh, uh, perhaps uh, some sort of compensation uh, if you are going to hire, for example, uh, let's say a child artist uh, who, who is performing in a, uh, in a, in a show. Um, the, the question in the Philippines has always been not the existence of uh, laws and rules and regulations, but actually enforcement. And uh, so child labor, uh, as well as uh, issues relating to, uh, let's call it, uh, uh, treatment of uh, uh, laborers in general, uh, has always been an issue of enforcement. Now, uh, the good news, of course, is that as the economy is growing, and also uh, on, on one end, uh, such that the jobs and uh, and incomes are actually increasing on on one end. Uh, the second uh, side is that uh, uh, civil society as well as uh, uh, other stakeholders are actually taking more notice of these issues. Again, before that was probably brushed under the rug, uh, even if they knew certain situations uh, or even situations in sweatshops. You know, the, the the typical situation we're in, you have people working overtime for literally minimum or less than minimum wage. Uh, in the old days, nobody would speak out against it. Now, I guess with the benefit of, uh, one, the internet, two, uh, the fact that the people do find it easier to actually talk to the press these days and you have a freer press. Uh, I think these are very important uh, factors 
in terms of making sure that uh, loss rules and regulations are actually uh, followed. And if they're not followed, these practices are exposed so that uh, wrongdoers are actually brought to justice. No, actually, the, uh, the, the industry is growing, in fact, uh, still at the fast clip of uh, something like about 30 percent uh, per annum in terms of jobs generated in the sector. Uh, and in fact, last year, the Philippines overtook India in terms of the, at least the call center, uh, as the call center destination. Uh, what's actually happening is, is not so much, uh, I guess, a, a slipping away from the call center part of the business, but actually a diversification out of the, what we call voice, into the non-voice, such that today you're finding out that more and more uh, outsourcing uh, firms are focused on, let's call it back office, back office work. So you take a look at the... Uh, uh, so uh, is there a lot of back office work done, say, for example, in banking and finance in the Philippines? Uh, huge. Uh, to give you an example, a, uh, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, uh, HSBC have uh, their own uh, captive, uh, uh, let's call it outsourcing firms, uh, in the Philippines. And uh, but that also means that you have a very highly educated workforce. Uh, it, it means that, uh, you, well, th that's true. Actually, what it does is that it's created jobs on the uh, medium to higher end uh, of the scale in the Philippines, as opposed to perhaps in the 80s, where uh, there were not enough jobs and you found a lot of the, uh, these people uh, looking for jobs outside the country. So in one sense, it's retained jobs in the in country. It's also generated a new type of uh, uh, skill set for uh, Filipinos in country. Uh, you talk about uh, HR management, accounting, uh, finance, uh, uh, BPO uh, jobs. Uh, and in, in the case of uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, for example, very good example, is that they've now located, uh, similar to what, uh, for example, we at Citigroup used to do where we ha uh, uh, had a huge uh, Mumbai office uh, of uh, young kids basically running all these financial analysis, for example, the charts that I would have in the back. They now do it uh, uh, in, uh, in the Philippines. And, uh, and so that's one area, although uh, India, for example, is uh, still ahead of the Philippines in the uh, engineering space. But the Philippines is probably ahead in what we call the medical uh, uh, BPO space, i.e. transcribing uh, medical records, as well as uh, analyzing uh, medical records, especially now in the U.S., there's this huge move to digitize all these uh, medical uh, uh, records. Um, perhaps the largest uh, group, when when you talk about the activity, has to do, outside of the uh, uh, call center activity, has to do with maybe supporting credit card activity, and these are just like basic applications as well as credit analysis. So uh, it's a growing business and. Uh, uh, the government and the association that uh, is involved in the business process outsourcing uh, firm uh, sees uh, the industry as continuing to be a sunrise industry that will be uh, one of the foundation uh, uh, or one of the pillars uh, of uh, the Philippines' growth probably in the next 10 years. It's only going uh, uh, upward. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask a question as well, uh, since we're focused on the Philippines. Uh, we discussed earlier today this issue of corporate culture diplomacy. I'd be interested to hear if you know of any best practices of corporate culture diplomacy that maybe have taken place in the Philippines. Uh, and dependent on your answer for that, if you also uh, would recommend, that's for companies who wanted to engage more in the Philippines, uh, certain best practices. Well, I think, well, m maybe taking the uh, uh, BPO industry uh, as, a, as an example, uh, here's where the ability to actually operate uh, across cultures and actually uh, within maybe parameters of, uh, of other countries become a day-to-day -day type of things. For example, if you're uh, in the Philippines and you're responsible for, uh, let's call it, uh, answering the phones for uh, some company that's based in Texas, clearly one of the training that uh, they give all these uh, call center agents is, uh, uh, number one, uh, they may even have the Texas twang uh, to it. Secondly, the ability to actually uh, uh, take on a conversation, uh, taking on perhaps what uh, somebody in Texas would uh, find uh, uh, to be a normal conversation, talk about sports, talk about uh, what's happening uh, in, in the U.S. 
Uh, so uh, essentially part of the training that goes on, and actually I'm quite familiar with this because my wife spent some time training uh, BPO uh, employees, and uh, they, they would go not only to what they call accent neutralization, but the bigger part was actually the cultural background uh, of, uh, of who they were working for and, and basically making sure that on an operational basis there was an appreciation of, uh, of, uh, of how somebody who might be complaining or asking uh, you to help them through setting up their computer uh, would, would go through it. And by the way, that goes not just uh, to U.S. companies, it basically goes through uh, any other country that uh, 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 there's a, a service being provided. I think, for example, the medical profession uh, in the Philippines uh, has tended to produce a lot of exports uh, in, in terms of uh, medical doctors as well as nursing uh, employees that are essentially physically exported to the rest of the world. And uh, that actually also creates... Uh, uh, in one sense, maybe not under a particular corporation or maybe under a, a healthcare uh, or an HMO. But I think uh, individually, there's always this uh, um, uh, operational and day-to-day and -day, uh, view that uh, in terms of uh, doing your own job, you, you, you need to actually uh, not only interact, but perhaps understand and empathize with the, uh, with the clientele that you're uh, dealing with. And maybe another question to follow up on the last slide of your presentation. As the president of the Philippine Stock Exchange, and we talk about brand Philippines, what is the biggest asset you think that the, there is to the brand Philippines, or what, what is the most important aspect, and what is the biggest challenge uh, when representing the brand Philippines abroad? Uh, well, uh, the current tagline, of course, is more fun in the Philippines, but that's obviously uh, for to bring in uh, uh, tourists. Although we do say that uh, uh, from the financial sector, it's more fun investing in the Philippines uh, simply because of the way things are, are working today. I think the, uh, when we talk about brand Philippines, uh, the single largest asset, I think, and I would argue, outside of the natural resources of, of the country are the human uh, resources of the country, uh, which tend to be uh, quite resilient, uh, number one, as well as quite adventurous in terms of, uh, you know, there's a huge uh, Philippine diaspora, Filipino diaspora around the world. And uh, it's about 10% of the total population, about, I think about close to 100 million Filipinos uh, around the world and about close to 10 million of those are spread around uh, countries uh, uh, around the world. So I think that's, uh, that's probably a testament to the ability to survive as well as uh, interact uh, uh, across uh, cultures. The biggest uh, challenge, I think today, the, the biggest challenge for us uh, as a nation is uh, being consistent in what we say and do uh, from the governance side as well as from the perhaps the, the legal and practice side because uh, we've gone through periods where in uh, good years and then maybe some policy reversals or perhaps electing the wrong guy into office tends to then reverse some of these uh, things. So I think that'll be the, the big challenge for Philippines Inc. over the next uh, uh, you know 10 years or, or maybe even longer. Uh, no, that's uh, in terms of the, that's a good question. Uh, there is not one, let's call it, uh, uh, exercise in terms of branding uh, I mean, for, for human resource uh, into branding, uh, you know, uh, Philippines Inc. Uh, outside. There are a number of uh, educational programs uh, held by various agencies, but I guess if the question is if it's uh, an integrated uh, uh, effort, uh, I think I'm afraid to say that it, it's not. It's a, it's a number of agencies who kind of do their thing, as well as uh, the private sector. So, uh, so I, I think that, and that could be, by the way, a function of the fact that uh, you have a diverse range of, uh, let's call it uh, uh, human resource exports. Uh, although I do think that the largest uh, group uh, today are the, what, what we call the semi-skilled uh, laborers who go out uh, across the world you know, for construction sites and the like. And, and maybe the second largest uh, group are those in the service sector, but that includes uh, not just the medical uh, professionals and uh, and uh, meaning medical doctors and nurses. That also includes those in the tourism industry. There's a lot of, of uh, Filipinos uh, in the uh, 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 what do you call it the uh, uh, cruise uh, industry, serving as uh, not not just as uh, as captains but also as uh, entertainers as uh, 
as a shipmen as well as uh, your basic hotel workers on the ship. And that's a big in uh, industry export for the country. Uh, clearly, inclusive growth is one of the topics that uh, is very important and uh, what uh, is being talked about in the Philippines. And you know, today, the, the Philippines probably has crossed the line in terms of uh, GDP per capita. I think it's, it's somewhere around uh, uh, 27 or maybe 2,800 US dollars per person. Uh, with, if you use a divider of uh, close to about uh, 100 million Filipinos uh, as your divisor. Now that's uh, somewhere in the middle of the, uh, let, let's call it the emerging world, uh, when you consider countries like maybe uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, in, uh, amongst uh, close nations. So uh, probably not too bad. The issue, however, as we discussed earlier, is that uh, if you're talking about the 1%, the top 1% versus the ordinary person, there is a huge divide. And uh, there still is poverty in the nation. There still are pockets of uh, and areas which are what we call depressed areas where development, uh, industry, and business has probably not, in fact, has not been able to reach. So the challenge for the private sector as well as government is to expand that uh, this uh, growth to be more inclusive. And I, and I think at the end of the day, uh, the argument is there will be trickle-down uh, effects later on, but the, the challenge is to basically grow as fast as possible and grow outside of the urban area so that you actually have more people employed in various types of industries and they do find uh, inclusive growth so that uh, you don't have a marginalized uh, uh, sector of society. Well, Mr. Sikat, thank you very, very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, I think much. really it was a highlight. So you're representing not only uh, the Philippines, but also the, the, the sector of stock exchanges. So I think for both points of view, we really benefited greatly from your insights, as well as the discussion that followed. So please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude for Mr. Hans Sikat.